Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to St. Peter's of the Valley Episcopal Church Morning Prayer Rite 2 this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. I'm the Reverend Wendy Huber. I'm the priest at St. Peter's of the Valley Episcopal Church in Basalt, Colorado. I'm joined by my colleague and friend, the Reverend Richard Paxton, our deacon at St. Peter's of the Valley, as well as our wonderful readers and prayer leaders this Sunday, Anne Blackwell, as well as Terry Lott Richardson, and my family who will also be helping as readers this day. We're blessed to have music provided by Rachel Rausch, our music director with our soloist, Tammy Kenning. Today we celebrate morning prayer right too. Morning prayer can remind us, especially when we've been asked to physically distance from one another, we're not alone. Our service begins on page 77 of the Book of Common Prayer, or you can see today's service bulletin, which was sent by email or on our website. Feel free to respond and join us during prayers and enjoy a few moments of silence as we prepare to worship and enjoy our opening hymn. Our service opens. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Continuing on page 79 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our service continues on page 80. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us join together in singing the Venite, found on page 82, with our leader soprano, Cherry Paxton.
The psalm appointed for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, proper 20, is Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8, beginning on page 801 in the Book of Common Prayer. Please join me in praying in unison. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and of great kindness. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter one, verses 21 through 30. To me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our service continues on page 93 with Canticle 18. Let us pray this together. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. from Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God.
Lord, may quiet our hearts that we may listen to your still small voice so that in hearing your word, we may respond in fervent faith as Jesus led disciples of old, so lead us, your children, today. We ask it in his name. Amen. Do you have any idea what garbage haulers are making today? The people who pick up the garbage from our homes, do you realize what they get each day? Those workers who are out there standing, working on the river, rerouting the water feature construction at the bottom of the street from St. Peter's of the Valley Church, do you know what they were making per hour? Have you seen what electricians are making per hour nowadays? A whole bunch of people want to be making as much as the garbage collector, the bridge workers, and the electricians. Oh, and what about those professional athletes? My gosh, they have some big salaries. And oh, and the television entertainers and those CEOs. Now, I don't know about you, but think about how you're beginning to feel right now. A little bit uncomfortable? We were all taught by our grandmothers not to talk about money and particularly about what others make or don't make. And if you want to get people upset in today's world, all we have to do is start talking about salaries. We often play that game of comparing our salary to someone else's salary. It's called the size up your salary game. And when we play that game, we usually compare our wages with a person who's making more money than we are. They're making more money and they seem to have less skill in education and then we become upset and we don't usually say anything, but we simmer inside. And that's the way we play the size up the salary game. Money, salaries, equal pay for equal work, affirmative action, those words are trigger words and they cause tension within us. And it's with this tense and conflict-filled mood that we approach the parable for Jesus today. Jesus' parables are rarely about church. You may be hard pressed to find a parable of Jesus that is about church. Not one parable about candles, not one parable about canticles, not one parable about choirs, not one of his parables is about preaching or pews or processionals. Jesus' parables are from everyday life. They're from the marketplace, the farm, the family. And today's parable it's about salaries, wages, and a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Today's parable is about the pocketbook, the billfold, the daily or hourly income. People always get tense and anxious and nervous when you talk about money and salaries and income. And Jesus was and is a master storyteller. When you examine the parables of Jesus, they are always quite creative. Some scholars rightfully claim that Jesus was the father of the short story. And the story for today, once again, Jesus uses everyday common life experiences. What was the dominant farm crop in Israel at this time? Grapes. And so Jesus would tell a story about harvesting grapes. And the story goes like this. There was this man who owned a vineyard and he needed workers to harvest his grapes. He went to the village square at six o'clock in the morning and hired workers who went out and worked all day for 12 hours until six at night. And a 12 hour day from six in the morning till six at night. And next some workers were hired at nine o'clock in the morning and they worked for nine hours. And those who came at noon worked for six hours. And those at three o'clock for three hours and those who came late in the afternoon at five o'clock only worked one hour and they worked one hour and you know what the owner of the vineyard gave them a full day's wages and those early birds those industrious ones 
who'd worked all day from six in the morning for full 12 hours under the heat of the sun, those workers were mad that the latecomers received the same wage. That does seem to make a little sense to me. Don't you get mad when you've been working hard all day and someone else comes in and does a little bit of work and they get the same wage as you worked so hard all day long? Doesn't it make you mad when you're at it at work, when you're putting in the time and doing all the work and someone else is sloughing off and they get the same salary? Doesn't that make you mad? The workers in the vineyard didn't stop to figure out the meaning of the parable because they were so upset about the story itself. And what is the purpose of this story of Jesus? The parables of Jesus we know are always earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And so what's the heavenly meaning of this earthly story for today? The key to the story is the contrast between those who came at the last hour and those who came at the first hour. Those who came at the last hour were given a full day's wage. Those who were given a full day's wage at the last hour felt their wage was undeserved, unearned, and a wonderful gift from the owner. The wage was a gift a surprise, a wonderful delight. And there are Christians who feel that God's generosity to them is unearned, undeserved, and they are surprised at the generosity of God. Such Christians have this attitude that life has been a wonderful gift from God, such as these workers who came to work for only one hour and received a full blessing from God. Meanwhile, there are other religious people who were there at six o'clock in the morning and they worked all day long. They were born into the Christian faith. They were baptized into the Christian faith. They went to Sunday school. They went to youth group. They did confirmation. They worked in the altar guild. They sang in the choir. They served on the vestry or bishop's committee. They came to church every Sunday. They knew in their hearts that God owed it to them they had that inner attitude. If anyone deserves to be blessed by God, they did, for they've been faithful to God and his church all their lives. God, I deserve your blessing. I've earned your blessing because of my faithful behavior to you and the church throughout the years. But Jesus reminds us of two things in this parable. First, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about one of our Ten Commandments. In the very real sense, this parable is about coveting. While covet may not seem the most obvious word to describe what's going on here, it does fit both the emphasis of Jesus' teaching and the overarching emphasis in Matthew on the law and Jesus' representation of it in a way that transforms our thinking and doing coveting lies at the heart of this parable in a couple of ways. We covet what God chooses to give to other people. A parable is essentially an elaborate allegory. We're invited to see ourselves in the story and then apply it to ourselves. The wages at stake, even at the moment of Jesus' first telling of the parable, are not actually daily wages for vineyard laborers. But forgiveness, this theme of forgiveness, forgiveness, life, and salvation for believers. We need not literally be laborers in the vineyard, as we are all of us co-workers in the kingdom, just as the new Christian and the lifelong Christian. And in relationship, one believer to another, covetousness is a problem. The point here isn't necessarily that other folks receive blessings from God that we don't and that they get more or better or lovelier gifts from God. The problem is that they get the same as us and they don't deserve it, do they? They are less worthy or later arrivals or just plain worse sinners. They don't deserve the same as we, do they? Not nothing maybe, but certainly not the same. The parable's day laborers parallel perfectly with today's forgiven sinners in both our pews and our pulpits. 
we have a tendency, as the parable aptly illustrates, to covet and to be resentful of what others receive from God. The owner of the vineyard asks those who have worked longest and presumably hardest for him, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? The point is that God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness are God's to give away as God sees fit. And as a direct result of this, we covet God's power to forgive and God's control over who is forgiven and how. This parable is perfectly matched in the lectionary to the parable we didn't read, the parable of Jonah, a reading omitted this service, your homework, who has run away to avoid delivering the message of forgiveness that God sent him to proclaim. Jonah complains, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Surely this cannot be for them. It is ironic that Jonah, who had earlier declared that deliverance belongs to the Lord, has rejected the good news of who God is for others. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about coveting about our frustration with the grace of God as it applies not to us, but to others. Second, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard is about the first and the last. The parable itself displays a reversal of expectations. The last will be first and the first will be last. This is not only the summary of the parable, but a critical aspect of our New Testament theology. This element of the parable is taken up in the other Gospels and in Revelation, this seeming reversal of expectation, our sense of justice and even of our hopes is a central part of the New Testament. Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. So much for the human ideas of greatness. Who is worthy to climb the holy hill and enter the gates of God's kingdom? Some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. It is Jesus who is first and last, who tells us that we need not fear. For in the one who is both first and last, the first and last are brought together when we are called to lay down the burdens of our days and find our home with God. So we are all equal recipients of God's gifts. The danger of our faith is that we may become covetous and jealous when God's gifts of forgiveness and life are given to other in equal measure. We need to be ever mindful that Jesus loves each of us and treats each of us with the same love and forgiveness and expects each of us to do the same. This week, let's redouble our efforts to put away our covetousness and jealousy and give thanks rather for our many, many blessings. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our service continues on page 96 with our affirmation of faith as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Our service continues with prayers on page 97 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the suffrages be on page 97 in the Book of Common Prayer. <clears throat> Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the ways of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. And now we'll read the collects, pages 98 and 99, for day. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. For Sunday. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord God. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For rain. O oh God, Heavenly Father, who by thy Son, Jesus Christ, has promised to all those who seek thy kingdom and its righteousness all things necessary to sustain and to oops lost my place to sustain their life send us we entreat thee in this time of need such moderate rain and showers that we may receive the fruits of the earth to our comfort and to thy honor through jesus christ our lord amen a collect for peace O oh god the author of peace and lover of concord to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom defend us your humble servants in all assaults of our enemies that we surely trusting in your defense may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of jesus christ our lord amen a mission on page 101 Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you. For the honor of your name, amen. And our intercessions, For those serving in harm's way, Grant, Mike, Sean, Roly, and Frank. For those street seeking strength and guidance and healing, Danny, Moses and Heather, Frank, David, Lauren, Jeff, Bailey and her family, Bob, Helena, Jean-Michel, Julie, Reverend Mark, Ron, the Faulkner family, Dick, Carolyn, Bill, Ashley, and those who have lost their jobs. 
for those who have died, the Reverend Marsu Harris. And the prayer in the pandemic. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health and paying their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close remember those who have no options. May we May we who have to cancel our trips, remember those who have no place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of the economic market, remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for quarantine at home, remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God and our neighbors. Amen. <laughs> this Sunday, we continue our additional segment to our prayer, birthday blessings. We have most of your records for birthdays, but if we're missing yours, let us know in the church office. This Sunday, we celebrate September birthdays, Phoebe, Hollis, Nicholas. Our birthday blessing. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our service continues on page 101 with our general thanksgiving. Please join me. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Continuing on page 102. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. A blessing before our announcements and closing hymn. Go in peace to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, and follow the one who is your Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. A few announcements before our closing hymn. If you need pastoral care, please do not hesitate from reaching out. 
We are beginning to have very small gatherings, including our abbreviated Eucharist. And so please remember our next uh, abbreviated Eucharist will be September the 27th, and then every other Sunday with a to-go or drive-through Eucharist from 11 to 11.30. We hold a daily prayer Monday through Friday or fellowship time by Zoom. And we thank again those who serve this day, our days of Episcopal televangelism. The Reverend Richard Paxton, Rachel Rausch, Jackie Amthor, Tammy Kenning, Robert Huber, Ann Blackwell, Terry Lott Richardson. And we ask that you remember to support St. Peter's of the Valley as uh, we continue to uh, need to keep our doors open. Blessings this week. I am hopeful that by the time this airs, we will no longer have the smoke and haze in our air. And I am prayerful that we will have had wind and rains and snow to clean our airs, our air in the coming days. Please join us for our closing hymn. Oh